Good evening, and welcome to our study again tonight. It's great to have you here. Before we begin, I probably have to do this twice, once now and maybe in the beginning of the study, John. Let me give you a couple of announcements. One is very soon we have some brochures being made. We're going to have a meeting concerning the Israel trip in November and tell you all about the details. I've been orchestrating it, so we'll be doing that probably at the Healing Place, but I'll give you the exact time and date uh, probably very, very soon once those uh, brochures come in. And secondly, uh, some great news for those of you that were that we're coming to our 119 Bible study. Many of you have asked me about when it's going to start back up. It stopped because of COVID, and I just got some information from St. Vincent's 119 that we will be able to do it again on a regular basis. So tentatively starting, um, let's see, June 1st, which is a Thursday, we'll be doing this study. I'll do a review of the first five, five books or wherever, five chapters, wherever we get to or six. And then we'll go right back into John and we'll telecast it the same way we're doing it now. We'll broadcast it through our social media. Um, but it will be physically, you can be able to come at 119 the same things. We'll give you more details as that comes on, but we're very excited about it. Especially for those of you who are asking, when are we going to start that back up again? All right, let's go in the news today. Let's tell you some of the things that I don't want to tell you. Here's one. This is under um, New World Order. The Biden 10-step plan for global chaos. Why is French President Emmanuel Macron crying, uh, cozying up to China while trashing his closest ally, which is the United States? Why is there suddenly a talk of discarding the dollar as a global currency? Why are Japan and India shrudging that they cannot uh, follow the United States' lead in boycotting Russia and Russian's oil? Why is the president of Brazil traveling to China to pursue what he calls a beautiful relationship? Why is Israel suddenly facing attacks from its enemies in all directions. What happened to Turkey? Why is it threatening fellow NATO member Greece? Is it still a NATO ally? Uh, a mere neutral or a de facto enemy? Why are there suddenly non-stop Chinese threats towards Taiwan? Why did Saudi Arabia conclude a new pact with Iran, its former uh, arch enemy? Why was Egypt secretly planning to send rockets to Russia to be used in the Ukraine? Since when did the Russians talk non-stop but the potential use of tactical nuclear weapons. And why is Mexican President Andre Manuel Lopez Obrador bragging that millions of Mexicans have entered the United States, most of them illegally? And why is he interfering in U.S. elections by urging his expatriates to vote for Democrats? Why and how, in just two years, have confused and often incoherent President Joe Biden and his team created such global chaos? Well, let's answer it by giving you 10 ways in which America has lost all deterrence. Number one, Biden, Biden abruptly pulled the U.S. troops out of Afghanistan. Biden abandoned billions of dollars in U.S. equipment, the largest air base in Central Asia, and one billion dollar embassy. Our government called such a debacle a success. The world dis disagreed and saw it only as United States humiliation. Number two, the Biden administration allowed a Chinese high altitude spy balloon to traverse the continental United States, spying on key American military installations. The Chinese were defiant when caught and offered no apologies. Number three, in March of 2021, at an Anchorage, Alaska mini summit, Chinese diplomats unleashed a relentless barrage at their stunned and mostly silent American counterparts. They lectured the timid Biden administration diplomats about American toxicity and hypocrisy. And they have defiantly refused to explain why and how the virology lab birthed the COVID-19 virus that has killed tens of millions of people worldwide. Number four, in late June 2021, in response to Russian cyber attacks against the United States, Biden meekly asked President, Russian President Vladimir Putin to at least make off limits certain critical American infrastructure. Number five, when asked what he would do if Russia invaded Ukraine, Biden replied that the reaction would be dependent on whether the Russians conduct a minor incursion. Six, between 2021 and 2022, Biden seriously insulted and bragged that he would not meet Mohammed bin Salam, the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, and one of our oldest and most valuable allies in the Middle East. Seven, for much of 2021, the Biden administration made it known that it was eager and ready to offer concessions to re-enter the dangerous Iran nuclear deal at a time when Iran has joined China and Russia in new geostrategic partnership. Na, na eight, 
almost immediately upon inauguration. The administration moved the United States away from Israel, restored financial aid to radical Palestinians, and both publicly and privately alienated the current Benjamin Netanyahu government. Number nine, in serial fashion, Biden stopped all construction of the border wall and, o and opened up our border. He made it known that illegal aliens were welcome to enter the United States. Some six to seven million did, and he reinstated catch and release, and he did nothing about the Mexican cartel importation of fentanyl that has recently killed over 100,000 Americans every year. 10. In the last two years, the Pentagon has embarked on woke agenda. The Army is short by 15,000 in its annual recruitment quota. The defense budget has not kept up with inflation. One of the greatest intelligent leaks in United States history just occurred from the Pentagon. The examples explain well enough why our emboldened enemies do not fear us. Allies judge us unreliable and calculating neutrals assume America is in dissent and too dangerous to join. Yet without America, the result is a new Chinese order in which to quote the historian Thucydides, you've heard me quoting before, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. It's a sad time for America. Biden needs to go. He needs to go yesterday. Let me give you a little bit more. I've been telling you about this for probably years. Certainly, I've been stepping it up for months. Global currency is here. IMF unveils universal monetary unit or unicorn, unicoin. There it is on your, on your screens. You can see it. A new global currency has just launched, but 39% but of the global population has no idea what just happened. The Universal Monetary Unit, also known as Unicoin, is an international central bank digital currency that has just been designed to work in conjunction with all existing national currencies. This should set off alarm bells for every single one of us because the widespread adoption, adoption of a new global currency would be a giant step forward for the globalist agenda. The IMF did not create this new currency, but it was unveiled at a major IMF gathering earlier this week. This new Universal Monetary Unit was created by Digital Currency Monetary Authority. The organization consists of sovereign states, central banks, commercial and real retail banks, and other financial institutions and entities. It sounds like a secretive cabal of international banks and people and national governments, and it's conspiring to push this new currency down our throats. We are being told that the Universal Monetary Unit is Crypto 2.0, and those that created it are hoping that it will be widely adopted by, quote, all constituencies in the global economy. Sounds super shady and super scary to me. Of course, Digital Currency Monetary Authority is not the only one that's been working on a new digital currency. The, the UK has also been working on one. The same is true for the European Union. And it, would it surprise anyone that the Biden administration is touting the potential benefits of a digital form of the US dollar? I don't think it's a coincidence that governments all over the Western world are simultaneously developed what's called CBDCs, this digital currency. A lot of people out there will cheer when these digital currencies are introduced, but it's imperative to understand that once everyone is using them, your financial pri privacy will be totally gone. Can you imagine a world in which you are restricted from buying meat for a while because you have already used your carbon qu credits for the month? Your financial privileges could potentially be restricted at any time at the whim of a government bureaucrat. And if you're a big enough to troublemaker, you could be you could be deplatformed from the systems permanently. Man, this smacks right in the face of what John the Revelator said. This is a one world currency. This is you can't buy or sell without it. Uh, it's something that John would never have told you it was a digital system, but he knew it, he saw it coming. Some 70% of Americans, and I'll tell you this later also, admit to being stressed about their personal finances in these days. A majority, 52% of US adults, said their financial stress has increased since COVID-19 pandemic began in March of 2020. Most Americans simply don't care that these new digital currencies could open a door for great tyranny. This is the whole idea. Let me just be political here for a second. This is the democratic strategy. This is the global elite strategy. Get you used to something s slowly. It's like the fo frog in warm water. Just turn it up every now and then a little bit and nobody knows that this frog is going to boil to death. And that's exactly what's happening with this currency. I've been telling you the one step after another, after another. Now we have a global step that's already been launched. Can the mark of the beast be far away? Absolutely not. Those of us that are awake know 
that more important globalism does not lead anywhere good. Concentrating even more power in the hands of an international elite is always a bad idea. And that's exactly what's happening in our world. Israel. Ezekiel's bones live. Nearly half of the world's Jews now live in Israel. First time ever, by the way. At the start of 2022, there were a total of 15.3 million Jews in the entire world, 7 million of whom, roughly 46% of all Jews worldwide, resided in Israel. Uh, Israel's Central Bureau of Statistics revealed this past Sunday. In 1939, on the eve of World War II, Jews numbered 16.5 million, 449,000, only 3%, resided in the land of Israel. Think, they went from 3% to almost 15.3, uh, excuse me, almost uh, actually 46%. Uh, from 448,000 to 15.3 million since World War II. Just under 10 years later, in 1948, the world Jewish population had diminished 11.5 million of them because of Hitler and killing them. 650,000, 6% lived in Israel. Among diaspora Jews, those who have been scattered, about 6 million live in the United States right now. 442,000 in France, 382,000 in Canada, 292,000 in Britain, 173,000 in Argentina, 445,000 in Russia, 118,000 in Germany, another 118,000 in Australia, according to the report. In April 17th of this year, the CBS also revealed that 147,199 Holocaust survivors or victims of anti-Semitic actions during the Holocaust are currently, right now, living in Israel. Of those survivors, 61% are women, 39% are men. Some 70,000 people from 95 different country, countries immigrated to Israel in 2022. It's Ezekiel's dry bones. They're living, they're coming back. Jewish agency data for the period between January 1st and December 2022 shows that 37,000 arrived from Russia, and it goes on and tells you they came from the Ukraine, from North America, from France, from Belarus, from Ethiopia, from Argentina, from Great Britain, from South Africa, and from Brazil. They're coming from all over the world back into Israel. That is a prophecy fulfilled. It is predicted that by the year 2048, the 100th anniversary of the State of Israel, two-thirds of the world's Jewish population, about 12 million people, will live in Israel. It is a prophecy being fulfilled in your lifetime. Let's give a little bit about economy. This one says, Americans stress over finances. How will they handle the coming recession? You heard me right, recession. We're talking about inflation now, but now they're talking about a coming recession. Right now, banks all over the country are getting ready really tight with their money. Large corporations are laying off workers at a frightening pace, and consumers are cutting back on their spending. In other words, it's really starting to look a lot like a recession out there and economic conditions are only going to get worse and more harsh in the months ahead. I know it's not good news. Things are already far from great. And one recent survey found that, as I told you before, 70% of all Americans are feeling, quote, financially stressed. Inflation, economic instability, a lack of savings, have an increased number of Americans feeling financially stressed. More than half, 58% of all Americans, are now living from paycheck to paycheck. Unfortunately, the truth is that financial stress is just beginning for many families because a significant economic downturn is definitely on the way. Federal Reserve is even publicly admitting for the first time ever that a recession will, quote, start later this year, a potentially ominous sign for President Joe Biden as he heads into an election campaign. I can't believe this guy's even thinking of trying to run for president. He's running away from president, if you ask me. I honestly cannot remember the last time that the Federal Reserve actually predicted that a recession was coming. Matter of fact, I don't think they ever have. Normally, the Fed is a wildly optimistic organization with projections because they want us to have faith that their policies are working. But now even they have thrown in the towel. Bank of America is also sounding the alarm. Analysts at the bank recently shared 12 charts that show the economy is about to enter a full-blown recession. A major credit crunch is here. Crunch is here. And it's going to send major shockwaves throughout the entire economy. The last time we witnessed anything like this was 2008, and we all remember what happened back then. According to a survey that KPMG conducted not too long ago, 91% of corporations, corporate CEOs in the United States are, quote, convinced we are heading toward a recession in the next 12 months. In fact, we just learned that Best Buy will be giving the ax to workers in hundreds of stores. They'll be doing it in 900 stores 
they'll be firing it, firing people. Sadly, the entire retail industry is in huge trouble at this point. The retail apocalypse that we went through a few years ago will be nothing compared to what we'll soon be experiencing. According to analysts at UBS, we could eventually see more than 50,000 retail stores in this country permanently close their doors. Not only did they do it after COVID, now we're looking at 50,000 more. Tens of thousands of store closures are coming across the United States, according to the analysts. More than 50,000 retail local locations could permanently shut their doors over the next five years. This is one nail in the coffin for commercial real estate. A second nail in the coffin for commercial real estate is the fact that so many restaurants are in trouble all over the nation. For example, dozens of Burger King locations, they never shut down. Burger King locations will soon be shut down as the entire chain grapples with disappointing sales. Uh, last month, Meridian Restaurants Unlimited, which has 118 Burger King locations across the United States, filed for bankruptcy, having racked up 14 million in debt, and they will close their stores. It's set to close 27 stores in Minnesota, Utah, Montana, Kansas, Nebraska, and North Dakota. A third nail in the coffin for commercial real estate is the record high office vacancy rates that we're seeing all over America. In San Francisco, the vacancy rate is up to almost 30%. We are heading into the greatest commercial real estate crash in U.S. history. The following comes from Fox Business. The commercial real estate market may be headed for a crash that rivals 2008 financial crisis this year. The truth is, what we are witnessing is the culmination of many long-term economic trends. Our leaders, if you want to call them that, have been making disastrous economic decisions for decades. And now, we're going to reap what they have sown. You can't rob Peter to pay Paul. And that's what they've been doing for decades. As they, as they are killing our economy, let's talk about war, what's going on there. China is selling off U.S. Treasuries as it prepares for a possible blockade of Taiwan. This is not a good news, not for our economy, not for war preparation. We are very close to a war with China that most people don't realize. You, you, U.S. officials in Washington are deeply concerned that the Chinese may impose a full-scale blockade on Taiwan as the first step in reunification campaign. Many Americans don't realize that such a move would be a really, really big deal. If China chooses to blockade Taiwan, the United States and China will instantly be in a state of war. All of a sudden, the flow of high-end computer chips from Taiwan would completely stop. All of a sudden, the flow of products that we import from China would completely stop. In other words, our standard of living would be radically altered for the foreseeable future. Can you, see, can you see the problems that are in the air for America? It's one after another after another. Almost sounds like we're being set up. Almost sounds like we have abandoned God and God's lifting his hand. Again, I don't want to give you dire news, but these are, this is the truth. This is what we need to hear. I think we need to hear from pulpits, to be honest with you. In recent months, China has been making moves to reduce economic exposure to the United States. One of those moves has to be sell off massive U.S. Treasuries that they hold. In fact, January was the sixth month in a row in which Chinese holdings of U.S. Treasuries fell. Let me inject something here that I just want to tell you. I'll stop this article for a second. And we are so foolish. The Biden administration now, and just this week, is talking about getting us to be able to buy, to buy um, electric vehicles. They are saying that we need to have electric vehicles, I don't know, in the next, next 10 years, five years, all of us should be in electric vehicles. Forget the fact that there's no that there's no charging stations, very little. Forget the fact that China is the one that, that manufactures the batteries for these. That means that we are be putting ourselves in China's hands. We don't manufacture the batteries. It's illegal for us to mine the rare earth elements, cobalt, lithium, China can. So what in the world is the Biden administration doing? If you ask me, they're selling out and they're selling out big time. Let me go back to this article. Many analysts believe they're literally showing us China what they intend to do. During these drills, the Chinese practiced attacking Taiwan from the east for the very first time. If the Chinese fully encircle the island, Taiwan will totally be cut off from U.S. help. The U.S. could try to break the blockade, but that would mean shooting at the Chinese. On Monday, the Chinese sent more fighter jets towards Taiwan than ever before. 91 fighter jets had crossed the straits, the Taiwan Strait, and entered Taiwan's southwestern and southeastern airspace. The Chinese are making it very clear that they're not messing around. The moment that such an attack is launched, the war between the United States and China will have begun. But most Americans still don't take it seriously. Matter of fact, most Americans don't even know about it. 
Most Americans aren't hearing what I'm telling you today. You know why? Because we're too entrenched with our political mess. We're too entrenched with getting Democrats against Republicans and slandering all the way down the line. We are not thinking about America. This, gener this administration is not thinking about you or me or the future of America. We are so close to the edge, but both sides just continue to raise tensions even more. On Monday, the U.S. military sailed a guided missile destroyer right through a very sensitive area of the South China Sea, and the Chinese were not happy about that at all. In response to a question about a potential Chinese blockade of Taiwan, U.S. Secretary Lindsey Graham suggests that the U.S. might just blockade China in return. Unlike the conflict in Ukraine, although, there is no obvious peaceful solution to this crisis. Chinese leaders are absolutely obsessed with Taiwan. They've made reunification a very high priority. At this point, China is looking to establish military bases literally all over the globe. Why would they do that? To be able to strategically hit the United States. Let me tell you where they're going. According to the U.S. government, and we even know it, these bases include South China Sea Islands, Cambodia, Myanmar, Thailand, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, Djibouti, United Arab Emirates, Pakistan, Kenya, Sri Lanka, the Sheikhels, Tanzania in the Indian Ocean area, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu in South Pacific, and even Equatorial Guinea and Angola on the Atlantic coast of Africa. A showdown with China is certainly coming. In fact, a four-star U.S. Air Force general recently stated that he believes the U.S. and China will be, will be fighting before 2025. Needless to say, 2025 is just two years away. So we need to wake up. We need to wake up and go to the polls and do something about it uh, because we are in trouble in a, lot of different, in a lot of different levels. Let me give you a little bit about, about moral decay. Generation Z's mental health crisis is a spiritual crisis at heart. St. Augustine famously observed the human heart is restless until it found, finds rest in God, he said. That applies not only to individuals, but also to cultures and entire generations. Practically speaking, this restlessness could take many forms, including unprecedented mental health crises. A CDC spokesman bluntly stated young people, especially young women, are in crisis. In the New York Times, it summarized it this way, nearly three in five teenage girls felt persistent sadness in 2021, and one in three girls seriously considered attempting suicide. One in three. Some of you may have come from my generation. You never heard of teen suicide, ever. Never heard of transgender shooting places up either, especially Christian places. We are now 11 years into the largest epidemic of adolescent mental illness ever recorded. The CDC said, so did the New York Times. The timing of this unprecedented outbreak of anxiety, depression, and other mental health problems corresponds, listen, suspiciously with the rise of smartphones and social media apps. It helped create a generation which fragile psyches unable to deal with life's challenges. A reason that teen girls are especially hard to hit in this crisis is they spend more time on social media platforms and websites than do their male counterparts. Political scientist uh, Brian Burge suggests that religious commitment is another important factor. Those who rarely or never attend religious services suffer worse mental health than those who attend regular or weekly services. Not sure why that's going there. <laughs> I have no idea. Americans are under 25 are doing very badly when it comes to mental health. Those suffering the worst are young, female, liberal, and secular. For them, brokenness is incredibly the norm. So my computer just came on, and basically what, uh, what she's telling us is the exact same thing from the New York Times that I just told you. Highly religious people are in fact, thank you, Chad, more likely than their secular peers to describe themselves as very happy. One explanation for this is the proven positive social effects of religious belonging, including higher occurrences of stable, loving family relationships. Break the family up and everything goes. In 2020, the Institute for Family Studies reported that those who attend church rarely are more likely to get married than their non-religious neighbors and less likely to divorce. So when Generation Z doesn't want to go to church anymore, and they don't, they pay the consequences. Does an act of faith in God reduce the impact of mental health crisis on young people? Does a lack of religious faith leave others more vulnerable to it? St. Augustine would say, absolutely yes. Despite his lack of humility, with his familiarity with Generation Z, he would speak of their restless hearts, seeking in politics, gender identity, self-expression, and could only be found in a relationship with our Savior. 
God has made us for himself. The kind of postmodern individualism that Generation Z was raised with will never deliver on its promises. This mental health crisis is a spiritual crisis. Let me go a little bit further in. Serious, stay out of the way. Flower shops refusal to serve GOP highlights the right not to do business. Now, I'm not going to read you all this, but it's a shock still hasn't worn off from the shooting of the rampage of innocent children and Nashville's Covenant School. For some, that raw emotion has turned to a rage. People frantically look for someone to blame other than the transgender killer. And they're doing it. In Nashville right now, there's a flower shop that won't serve any flowers to GOP members, to Republicans. That's kind of a it's kind of a bad situation because you remember that Christians were accused of not being able to sell uh, to gay rights, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to make flowers or do cakes for people who are gay, for gay weddings. They were taken to court. Nobody's saying anything about this flower shop that's saying we're not going to sell to GOP lawmakers or anybody that's Republican because you think the guns are okay. So they get, a, they get a pass. Nobody's doing anything about it. They're just being able to do it. It's a double standard, and you're going to see more and more of it in our country. Let's go a little bit further in moral decay. Parental nightmare. State will have had kids from parents who don't approve gender. I told you that California had done it. California is pushing, passing, trying to pass a law that allows 12-year-olds, if they're not being, if they're not being addressed by their preferred pronoun from their moms or dads, to go to a guidance counselor to school and immediately be taken away from that family. Immediately. I told you before, you should move out of California. Now, if you have a 12-year-old or younger. Now, or even older, now Washington State has passed the bill to do exactly that. That they, and they're actually putting $7.5 million of taxpayers, Washington taxpayer money, to the Office of Homeless Youth Prevention and Protection to provide grants to organizations to pay for gender transition and abortion procedures. So not only can they take your children away from you if you don't refer to them at their, at their preferred pronoun, but they will be able to give them abortions if they ask it without your permission. This is absolutely unbelievable. Um, a horrifying reality is that Washington's bill is not the first of its kind, nor is it likely to be the last. Within a few months, Washington's induction of the bill, California already is a sanctuary state, and now Washington will become one. But all is not lost. Some states are taking the opposite approach of California and Washington. In response to increasing attempts to transition children in the state of Missouri, for example, Attorney General Andrew Bailey recently issued an emergency order restricting the use of experimental transgender interventions on minors. Thank God. His order was backed by a group of doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals, despite the predictable hue and cry of bigotry from transgender activists. In the meantime, parents who are skeptical of governmental efforts to divest them of their right to parent their kids might want to really start looking for real estate, for real estate in places like Missouri get out. My last one is a good news, and I think it's great news as a matter of fact. Uh, last week I called for boycotts. Everybody's been calling for boycotts, especially for Bud Light. Bud Light's, Bud Light's executives have to be the dullest people on the planet next to President Biden and his administration. Bud Light's parent company, Anheuser-Busch InBev, has lost more than $6 billion in market cap in just six days after Dylan Mulvaney's Partnership spark backlash. Bud Light's parent company has lost more than six billion in market capitalization since announcing its partnership with a polarizing transgender internet personality. Unveiled on April second, the brand's alliance with 26-year-old uh, Dylan Mulvaney, Mulvaney incited outrage and calls for a boycott, and now appears to be hitting Bush where it matters most in the wallet. And that's exactly what we have to do. We have to boycott these woke companies that want to ram everything down our throat. This is not America. This is less than 1% of Americans, and we don't need to stand for it. We need to raise our voice. We need to hit them where it hurts in their pocket. The CEO of, of um, some of the CEOs of Anheuser-Busch are now putting out pro-American ads with Clydesdales. It's too little too late. And basically they're saying they had no knowledge that this was going on. Well, if I'm a CEO of a big corporation, and I have some advertising executive putting out an ad like this and I don't know about it, they should be fired and I should be fired. And maybe that's the next step. We need to be able to fire these CEOs. We need to be able to hit them in their pocket. And please, please, I, I showed the vast list. You may not be able to do all of them, but you need to boycott some of these, especially where you spend most of your money. We need to let them know we are not 
Rep we are not going to back financially anything that you do that's woke. Whew, I can get off on a tangent. I'm going to stop. That's in the news for tonight. That's good news, by the way. I see all of you clapping out there. It's wonderful.